Something you will hear constantly in development is to always perform what we call server-side data validation. The reason why you should always perform server-side data validation is because any validation you put on the client side can be circumvented. In reality, you should never trust the client. So let's say you have some kind of a form where you can create a user here. For this form to work, you need to have a name that is greater than three characters. And the button will be disabled if there are not at least three characters. So a bot is valid, but Bo is not. Uh, the reason why this looks uh, like something that will work, but totally doesn't in the real world, is because any client that is interacting with your application here in the browser can basically just circumvent whatever you're putting in the UI. Now I'm going to just demonstrate how a malicious client would circumvent the client-side data validation we have here. But if you start off by just sending a valid request, like one with five characters, you can just copy the uh, uh, HTTP request here. And then instead of using the browser as the client application, you, you could just open up some other HTTP client like curl. And then in here, instead of using Bob, you now use Bo, which is a disabled a character. So now you're basically just sending the bow request here and you're getting a successful response because we're getting an ID back here. So we just circumvented the uh, button that is disabled here by just using a different HTTP client. So never put a uh, critical data validation only in the client side. You can also have a client side data validation, but you shouldn't only have that. What you should be doing is you should go to your server application here. This is the endpoint that we're using. So there's a controller method that's taken in a create user DTO and it's injecting that DTO into a service method called create user. So here we have a create user method and the create user method returns a new user. So this is the point at which we would do the server side data validation. Here you could do something as simple as just a Boolean expression. So you could say if DTO name uh, length less than three. And here we would throw new validation exception. Uh, cannot be less than three characters. So here the service is dealing with this uh, request by just throwing an exception. And then the exception will be pushed up to the controller. Here you could do try and then just catch validation exception. Now we return a bad request to indicate a status code 400. And now we can just take the exception message here and we return that to the client. And we run the application once more. And now I'll just uh, demonstrate this. So I'll just demonstrate this here in the browser with a, a fetch request. Uh, so now instead of Bobby, we'll use Bo here and uh, you will get a status code 400 back here and uh, go into uh, the users tab here and we'll see that it says cannot be less than three characters. So this works as intended. Uh, there is one slightly more clean way of actually doing this. So if you just remove the try catch block here, and uh, then just above your controller uh, class, you write API controller. So the API controller does a lot of great things. And one of the things is it makes a global exception handler for you. That means that if you have an unhandled exception like this method here, uh, throwing a validation exception, and you are not locally handling it here, it will be handled by the API controller attribute. So I'll just uh, show you what that looks like. Now we try to actually send the invalid request here. Uh, we're going to get this back here. So there is a ton of stuff here. The, uh, the response actually starts here where it says cannot be less than three characters. So the, the intended result of getting an invalid response is definitely happening. And this is some of the stuff that you'd be very interested in having on the server side. So if there is an exception, we can go into the logs here on our server application, and then we can ex uh, in inspect this 
but they maybe are not very interested in sending this back to the client. Uh, so there is a way that we are actually supposed to handle uh, error responses that we are sending back to HTTP clients. And uh, inside of the builder phase here, you can add something called problem details. Add problem details. So uh, make a semicolon here and uh, shut down the application on the application again. So I'll just uh, try and show you what it's going to look like in a browser. Uh, so first of all, I had the, uh, this was the uh, invalid request that we had first, where it says cannot be less than three characters here. And then this is just a long stack trace. Uh, this here is the one using the problem details. So here, the message we are sending back to the client is inside of the details key inside of a JSON object. So this is just to show a slightly better way of actually making responses once the server application is denying some kind of HTTP request. So when you're making these uh, error responses, it is very essential that the service layer here doesn't actually know what the client application is. So right here we're using an exception, but that's just a generic C-sharp construct. It doesn't actually know that the API here is going to treat this in a certain way. You see, the API is one layer above the service. That means the API is catching the exception using the API controller, and then it is making an HTTP response once it has handled the exception. Uh, so that means anything below the API doesn't know about the network communication and how it's going to respond to a client. And also, you could never do something like return bad request here, because bad request is something that exists within an API dependency. So we don't make HTTP responses here. We make exceptions. And then the exception is handled at the API layer, which then returns an HTTP result to the client application. Maybe you look at this code and you think, okay, then you're just going to have one if statement here and another if statement here and yada, yada, yada. Uh, yes, but we do have more fancy ways of actually expressing the data validation rules that we have. A uh, very common way is to put this on the model. So you could uh, take the DTO model here uh, responsible for actually being deserialized into C sharp. So of course, this is the model that's taking the JSON and then the JSON is being turned into a tangible C sharp object here. We have something called data annotations that we can put onto our properties here. So if you have some minimum length, then you can put the minimum length as a number inside of an attribute. So this here is also totally valid. So let's uh, try and rerun this program now. And uh, let's uh, try and send the uh, invalid request here. So when you're using data annotations, the way that the error response is going to look like is this. Uh, notice that it says errors, and this is a, a nested JSON object. And it takes in some keys, which is the property names. So we have a property called name on our DTO model. And then there could be any number of validation errors. So you could have many things that are being violated and it will just list these in an array. And then if you have some other um, property like email, then the email could also have an array of uh, violations. So this is a slightly better way of doing it where you don't have to manually put in a bunch of if statements up here. However, we do have even more fancy ways of doing it. So I want to show you something called uh, Fluent Validation. So you can install it uh, using the graphical uh, representation of the NuGet Package Manager here in your IDE, or you can use a CLI for installing the package. I want to install the one called Fluent Validation to my service package, and uh, then I'm going to install Fluent Validation Dependency Injection to my API project here. So first off, I'll just delete the old validation I have here. And uh, now I'm going to create a class here. Public class create use of DCO valid data. And it's going to extend something called abstract validator. And then I'm going to put in the, uh, the type here, which is create user DCO. 
And uh, now we're going to make a, a constructor here. So I'm going to say public create user DTO validator. So there exists a, a type here inside of the abstract validator called rules for where you had to specify a property on your model. So you have a user here and now you make this little arrow syntax and you reach for the name property. And then you can take the length of the name string here and then you can just chain together methods. So for instance, we want a name that is length of three or greater than. Uh, greater than or equal to three, that would be the more correct way to express this. So of course, uh, the validator here could use many different properties. So you could have, let's say, 10 different validation rules for the same model. And now we need to actually invoke the validation using the validator here. Uh, the easiest way to do this, if you don't have any scalability in mind, is to simply just instantiate the validator. So you would write new uh, create user DCO validator, and then you could use the method th validator and throw here, and then just put the object into the uh, validator throw method. So this way, if you're running the application now, and uh, we go into our console here, and uh, we make the uh, malicious uh, request here with uh, inserting a uh, too short uh, name. And we go to the networks tab here. Now we get the, the validation exception here, where it says name length must be greater than or equal to three. So we are successfully using a validator using a validation framework. We can actually improve upon this because here we're actually instantiating something we are depending on. So we are violating the inversion of control principle here, which means that I would rather have uh, the validator be uh, required by this service. So we could go to the constructor here and say that we require a create user DCO validator. We just call it validator. And then we use that instance here. So we say validator, validator throw. We'll just uh, make an instance variable here. So validator equals validator, uh, create fields, and then require the instance variable here. So now our new problem is, how do we actually inject the validator into the service class here? Uh, well, luckily that is not very hard. You can either go into the program CS file and do this in a semi-automatic fashion. Uh, just before the I use a service is being injected here, you go to builder services, add scope or add single or however you want to do it, and then just inject a create user DTO validator. This is one way of doing it. Uh, but the, if you have a lot of validators, which you might end up having if you start having a program that grows, uh, then this will become very bloated. And every single time you inject a new validator, uh, you have to go into your program CS file. So there is a more automatic way of doing this. So recall we installed the dependency injection framework for a fluent validation into our API project. So if you go into your project file here and you see you have this one here, uh, that means inside of the program CS file, you also have something called add validators from assemblies or from assembly. Uh, here, what you're actually going to use is the keyword type of. So there is one project where you probably have all of your validators. Uh, in my instance, it's the service project. So I'm going to put in the user service here and now specify the assembly for the user service. So this way, even if you have multiple validators, they will automatically be injected. And of course, you should do this before you add your services. So first, you eject your validators, which the services they require, and then you inject your services, and then you inject your controller or whatever you have in the API layer. And now, if you run the application.net run, and you go into your console here, and you send the invalid uh, request, uh, you should still get the invalid response here. 
but now it's handled by a framework that also does a automatic dependency injection. So this way, you will not be bloating all of your service methods. So here you can still have a service method that, like this that is relatively nice and clean. Keep in mind that uh, this way is actually slightly less automatic than uh, back when we just used data annotations. And that is because the data annotations here, like uh, min length uh, three, is automatically being triggered by the API controller attribute. So this one, not only does it catch the exception, this one also triggers validation. So it triggers validation once you get to the action result. However, if you have more fine-grained validation rules that needs to be expressed in a more nuanced way than what you can do with the data annotations here, then I recommend you use a framework like the Fluent Validation. Technically, you could also add logic that automatically triggers validation such that you take your validator and you call the validate and throw for every single service method. But I think for now, uh, this might be taking it a little too far. I think this is a nice and clean way for actually performing validation at the service level based on some kind of object supplied to a service method.